Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Wu. I am a, proud to serve as Boston City Councilor at large, and today in my capacity as chairwoman of the City Council's Arts, Culture, and Special Events, hosting a hearing on docket number 0483, order for a hearing regarding the Fenway Cultural District. This matter was sponsored by uh, myself, Councilor Ariana Presley, Councilor Josh Zakum, and Councilor Tito Jackson on March 29th, 2017. And today we will be hearing from members of the City Council, members of the public, and our distinguished panelists on the redesignation, reapplication of the Fenway <coughs> Cultural District after, uh, I, would, I would say, a very successful five-year run to date. Um, so I just want to remind everyone that we are being taped. Uh, there's a video camera, thanks to Carrie Jordan from the Boston City Council in the back. And while the City Council is still working on our ability to live stream off-site, so we're not live, unfortunately, this moment, this tape will be available on the City Council website uh, in a day or so. And it will also be rebroadcast on Comcast 8, RCN 82, uh, and streamed. The rebroadcast will happen this Saturday at 7 a.m. So at this time, um, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Councilor Josh Sakum, for any opening remarks. Uh, after the council speaks, we will hear from our panel and then open it up for public testimony. Um, oh, sorry, one quick thing. I do want to note several of my colleagues are on the way in transit. Um, and Councilor Andrea Campbell also would like me to read a letter into the record uh, from her. May 31st, dear colleagues, regrettably, I'm unable to attend today's hearing on the Fenway Cultural District due to a previously scheduled conflict. I look forward to reviewing the recording upon my return. Sincerely, Councilor Campbell, Boston City Council District 4. Uh, and then one final, we'll hear from her, I'm sure, at some point, but Kelly, uh, who is walking up the stairs, wanted to give you a special thank you for convening, organizing, um, and everything you do for the Cultural District. Councilor Sakum. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you all for coming here today. Uh, it's uh, exciting to be in the opportunity to reauthorize the uh, cultural district and to see so many familiar faces uh, from the neighborhood and from our cultural institutions here that really uh, give me such pride to represent much of the Fenway, not all of it. I know Councilor Jackson, uh, I think, believe in, in this building uh, is in his district, but um, there's certainly so much to offer from our cultural institutions, the institutions of higher education, to obviously the people who live in our neighborhoods, and I think it's been wildly successful um, to designate this as a formal cultural district, and I want to continue <coughs> that work to make sure that we from the city, um, and it's great to see the mayor's office has been such a supporter of this and is represented here on the panel, um, to make sure we're doing everything we can to, uh, to enhance these advantages and to grow on them and to build on them and to continue both culturally, economically, um, and from a quality of life perspective, making sure our neighborhoods have all the support they have. So uh, Council Wu, I want to thank you for your leadership in bringing this forward and leading this committee. I look forward to hearing from our panelists and from others, um, but this is obviously something important and it's great to be in a beautiful venue like this uh, out, out in the neighborhood for a hearing and uh, to see so many folks here taking the time in the middle of the day, it shows I think how important this is uh, to our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zakum. Um, so very fittingly, as we're discussing the cultural district and all of the rich assets contained within, we have leaders representing various institutions within the district. We'll start with our host, uh, Mark Kerwin here at the MFA, then to our Chief of Arts and Culture for the City of Boston, Julie Burroughs, and then I think there's some order changes, so then I'll defer to the panelists as to what order they'd like to speak after that. Uh, thank you, uh, Council President Wu and Council Lozakum. My name is Mark Kerwin, and I am the Deputy Director here at the Museum of Fine Arts. On behalf of my Matthew Teitelbaum, the director of the museum, I welcome you to the MFA. We're happy to host the Boston City Council in its hearing regarding the redesignation of the Fenway Cultural District. I also welcome you here on behalf of the Fenway Alliance as I have the pleasure of being their current board chair. 
The Fenway Alliance is the Massachusetts Cultural Council designated manager of the district, and we are celebrating our 40th anniversary this year, 40 years of collaboration between the 21 institutions that comprise the Fenway Alliance. The Fenway Alliance was a significant supporter and contributor in the work done to achieve the cultural designation five short years ago. Therefore, on behalf of the Alliance and one of its founding members, the Museum of Fine Arts, I ask that you strongly consider retaining the Fenway Cultural District designation. In the district, you will find some of the nation's most acclaimed cultural institutions, the Isabel Stewart Gardner, the Boston Symphony, the New England Conservatory, the Boston Conservatory, Berkeley College of Music, the Massachusetts College of Art, the Massachusetts Historical Society, the institution that I represent, not to mention some other great academic and cultural institutions in the district, some of which you will hear from in a moment. We are all here to benefit both the citizens of Boston and beyond. We work together in the cultural district to enhance tourism and cultural patronage. It is clearly one of the most vibrant cultural scenes in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, if not the nation. The Museum of Fine Arts considers the designation of the cultural district as important as the 1998 designation of Huntington Avenue as the Avenue of the Arts. At the MFA, we work diligently in light of our cultural and educational mission to enhance community accessibility to the cultural life, an important goal of the cultural district. In fact, our whole new strategic plan just adopted is about engaging and focusing on inviting the public boldly to the museum and its neighborhood to welcome our visitors warmly once here and to deeply engage with them as we seek to serve not only our great traditional audiences, but also others who perhaps feel not as engaged yet at the MFA. We feel and know that art is for everyone, and that is what the cultural district designation is also all about. We have worked to ensure through our community days and other programs that everyone can access the Museum of Fine Arts and see and experience a wide array of cultural programming and we are very pleased to host just shy of 10,000 people uh, on Monday at our Memorial Day open house. Steps in further engagement have begun this year with our successful overnights, fully embracing the notion of creating options for nightlife in the cultural district not seen in the city before. And more to come as we activate the environs of the museum by offering enhanced programming around <clears throat> and in the museum this summer. I hope you realize how important the cultural designation is to the vibrancy in the area, and again, I urge you to consider the approval of the redesignation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. My name is Julie Burroughs. I'm the Chief of Arts and Culture for the City of Boston, and I oversee the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, and we are the official local government partner with every cultural district that's designated in the City of Boston. Um, good afternoon, President Wu, Councilor Zakum. I'm so pleased to join you in supporting, um, testifying in support of this designation. Um, as you know, since the initial designation in 2011, there have been a tremendous number of changes in Boston. I'm new to Boston, so I am a great student of all those changes. There's a new administration who is very supportive of the arts and supported the creation of my department, my role, and a cultural plan for the city of Boston. There's new leadership at many of our cultural anchors and many of them within the Fenway Cultural District. And with all this new leadership, there's been new investment in arts and culture in Boston, not only from the city of Boston and our grant making through the Boston Cultural Council, but also the private sector and the philanthropic sector has stepped up to support the work of artists and organizations. The cultural plan Boston creates envisions a Boston where everyone can take advantage of engaging in arts and culture, where we really embrace an identity for the city of Boston that's contemporary, where arts and culture are at the heart of how we see ourselves as a thriving and innovative city. Now the cultural plan, a hallmark of the public engagement was community teams. And I'm very happy to say that every neighborhood in Boston had a community team who were given um, the tools and the freedom to engage that neighborhood in a dialogue of what were our assets, 
what were our opportunities and what were some challenges. And Kelly Brilliant was one of the co-chairs of the Fenway uh, community team. We talked a lot about bridging silos and really growing equitable access to arts and culture. And I can't imagine um, an organization that better embodies that work by bringing partners together and really enhancing access to the art through their access to the arts through their programs. Some of the goals of the cultural plan talk about creating fertile ground for our cultural ecosystem, helping artists to find a receptive community where their new ideas and their endeavors can take hold and flourish. And another goal is to cultivate a city where all cultural expressions are respected and promoted and resourced equitably and where opportunities to engage with arts are accessible to all. Another goal is to incorporate arts and culture into all aspects of civic life, including the public realm and the urban environment. And finally, one of the major goals of the plan, how we make this all happen, is to mobilize likely and unlikely partners to move forward collectively, to do together what we can't do separately. This cultural district and the work of the Fenway Alliance really is the way we mobilize partners, the way we move together collectively, the way that we populate the urban realm and engage all diverse audiences. I like to think of the effort of a cultural district is really symbolic of this kind of shift in mindsets, this culture shift where we can collaborate and work together to really maximize how we as a district can flourish. Um, I also think that a district and an entity to steward that district is a way to effectuate change in a sustainable way over the long haul. We're so excited to be the local partner for this effort and are very thrilled to continue to collaborate, support, and champion this very successful cultural district. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Burroughs. Uh, before our next panelist speaks, I do want to just mention that as, as noted, Councilors Jackson and, uh, Councilors, Councilor Tito Jackson and Councilor Ayanna Presley are now here with us, uh, both original co-sponsors of the 2011 uh, order to designate the cultural district. Good afternoon. We decided to go in order. <laughs> um, good afternoon, uh, Councilor uh, Wu and Zakum Jackson and um, uh, Presley. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here to speak to you this afternoon. My name is Curtis Warner and I'm the Associate Vice President for Community and Government Relations at Berkeley College of Music. And, uh, you know, I, I like to speak from two perspectives. Um, one is obviously the college, also being a part of the Fenway Alliance, being a part of the Pro Arts Consortium, which is uh, six institutes, six art institutes, um, but also a personal perspective, which is um, I've been in Boston since the late 70s, uh, went to school at Berkeley College of Music, and I remember when it, this was before it was, uh, this area was designated as a cultural district, but I remember when the Puerto Rican Festival was in the Fenway, back in the Fenway, and I don't think there was a moment ever that I thought the Fenway was not a cultural district. And so we know factually it is, but I do support it being redesignated as one. Um, one of the highlights for our institution uh, has been the opening our doors event. And uh, I think most of you know about it. The, the reason is because we're very much uh, proponents of access and access for those who might otherwise not have access to institutions such as the MFA or uh, Boston Conservatory or the Berkeley Performance Center even. And typically, opening our doors has happened on Columbus Day. And I think last year was the 15th year. And Berkeley College of Music has always been closed on Columbus Day 
And so we would identify groups to send to the MFA and the Gardner and other places. But this year, we held classes on Columbus Day. And we thought it was so important to be able to contribute to providing access to our institution as well. We held open rehearsals and performances. And I think that's, that's what's so important about this cultural district. Um, it can seem isolated from other parts of the city, but we all have worked very hard as we heard uh, Mark speak just a few moments ago um, and Julie. We've worked very hard to bring people into this district and to expose them to the types of activities and things that are going on. Um, I would strongly encourage you to think about the redesignation. Uh, we've, um, we, we have, just Berkeley alone, we present 400 free concerts in the summer. And at least half of those are in the Fenway in the Fenway. Um, again, it's about access. It's about identifying even with the word culture. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a big buzzword these days. And you talk about what does it mean. Someone once said to me that, well, you know, if it's, if it's cultured, it's not real. Well, I beg to differ. You know, uh, we, are, we are a culture in the Fenway. And so uh, thank you for your time. Not much else to contribute on that. Thank you. Councilor Zakem, Wu, Jackson, and Presley, thank you so much for taking the time today to um, hear us discuss uh, our love of the Fenway Cultural District and why we think it's important. Um, we had the Fenway Alliance, so maybe people in this room or maybe you're asking yourselves, well, why do you need a cultural district if you have a Fenway Alliance? What's the difference? What, what, what is additive? Um, and what I would say to that is we think differently now as the Fenway Cultural District. We think about partnership, collaboration, how can we work together? Um, the Fenway Alliance has always been wonderful in doing a lot of activism and trying to facilitate communication amongst the organization. But this is different. This is a level of excitement and interest and enthusiasm that we have not had previously. And it's meaningful because it means that everyone puts in that much more energy and effort and um, you know we we have a lot of different um, events and opportunities. Uh, opening our doors day was mentioned, but uh, just as an example, during the holiday pops at Symphony Hall, um, we are having 90,000 people in three weeks walking on our block at Symphony Hall. And why aren't those people walking down to the MFA? Why aren't they walking to Berkeley School of Music? Why aren't they walking up the Avenue of the Arts? And now that we are a cultural district, these are the kinds of challenges that we want to address. It's not about the Boston Symphony as an institution wanting to get more patrons to come. It's about how do we all work together to um, get our patrons to be interested in our in what's going on in our area, in dining in our area, and visiting galleries, and you know the public spaces at the universities, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I think that we all did not anticipate this when we started this journey, and every year it becomes more important and meaningful, and so. We need more time, we need to build this, and we pledge to do that um, to uh, the city council if you approve the designation. Thank you, Kim. Councilors, members of the public, and fellow panelists. My name is Tony Gaspard. I'm the community relations liaison for the First Church of Christ Scientist. And I'm grateful to be here today on behalf of the church which is a founding member of the Fenway Alliance and fully supportive of the Fenway Cultural District. Today, I'd like to talk about this place, Boston, Fenway, and our role in it. 
I would like to begin with a quote from scripture, from Psalms. Sing unto the Lord, all the earth. Show forth from day to day his salvation. Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. Boston is the original home of our church, which was founded by Mary Baker Eddy in the 19th century. Ours is a global church maintaining its headquarters here in Boston, a city which has a rich and blessed history, which includes its churches, its synagogues and mosques, its places of worship, as well as its political and cultural institutions. Over the years, the people of this city have thrived individually and collectively as we have come together as a community to encourage and support one another through every challenge that has arisen before us. Whether that challenge be racism, discrimination for sexual orientation or identification, economic or educational disparity, answers and progress have come and will continue to unfold as we work together to uplift and encourage one another. This spirit of community is what the Fenway Alliance and Fenway Cultural District embody. The Christian Science Plaza was built in 1975, the 70s, when there was so much racial unrest here in Boston. In response to that need, when the plaza was being built, the church funded an on-the-job training program for minority workers, who then became part of the workforce building the plaza. And the Catholic Church, with the blessing of Cardinal Cushing, sold an old theater which it owned near our church to us, so the land could be used as part of the plaza. These types of community partnerships help all of us thrive. More recently, in 2013, the church hosted the Boston Sculptors Gallery with a temporary installation of sculptures on the plaza called Convergence. The installation took place a week after the Boston Marathon bombings. It turned out to be more of a meaningful gift to the community than we realized. And presently, we are in the process of revitalizing the plaza, work that has taken years to come to fruition, but will be in itself a work of art when completed for all to enjoy for years to come. The institutions comprising the Fenway Cultural District have come together to bless the local and international community with all the resources we have, be it music, sermons, paintings, sculptures, and vibrant contemplative spaces for the public's use and enjoyment. We are here to bless and be blessed, to uplift and support one another. Last Sunday, Fareed Zakaria, host of a news program called The Global Public Square, stated concerning Manchester, England, following the senseless bombing of a venue that celebrates creativity and the arts, it is a reminder that it is often these exact things that can help us lift our souls in moments of despair. And because it echoes themes close to our hearts here in Boston, I would like to close with part of a poem by Manchester poet Tony Walsh entitled, This is the Place. This is a place that has been through some hard times, oppressions, recessions, depressions, and dark times. But we keep fighting back with greater Manchester spirit, northern grit, northern wit, and greater Manchester's lyrics. And there's hard times again in these streets of our city. But we won't take defeat, and we don't want your pity. Because this is the place where we stand strong together with a smile on our face, Mancunians forever. 
Because this is the place in our hearts, in our homes. Because this is the place that's a part of our bones. Because Manchester gives us such strength from the fact that this is the place. We should give something back. Always remember, never forget, forever Manchester, choose love. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. President Wu, Councillors Jackson, Presley, and Zakem, distinguished panelists and general public, um, I'm pleased to be here this afternoon in support of the petition for the redesignation of the Fenway Cultural District. Uh, my name is Jeremy Solomon. I'm the Associate Vice President for Communications and Public Affairs at Simmons College, located at 300 the Fenway. Since our founding in 1899, Simmons College has developed deep roots in the Fenway neighborhood. We have forged strong ties with neighbors and with the neighborhood advocacy organizations and for good reason. For our future is inextricably linked to the success and vibrancy of organizations like the Fenway Alliance and the, Fen and the Fenway community at large. The undergraduate population at Simmons College is 1,800, 1,200 of whom live with us here in the Fens. We know these young women are drawn to our school due to our faculty expertise, our practical education that prepares them for the modern day workforce, and our sterling academic reputation. But we also know that today's students deserve a well-rounded education, one that prepares them for the jobs of the future, yes, but also one that introduces them to new ideas and cultures and that fosters self-expression. Simmons College relies on the Fenway Cultural District to enhance our student experience. We encourage our students and our faculty and our staff to enjoy the music, the dance, theater, art, and other cultural and social initiatives the district provides. Signature events like Opening Our Doors, Public by Design, and TEDx Fenway have enriched the experience of living, working, and visiting the Fenway neighborhood for all of us at Simmons College. And we simply could not imagine life without them. The city of Boston has rightfully earned its status as a great American city for culture and the arts. I urge you to renew the designation of Fenway as a cultural district so the extraordinary programs and services that help knit our growing and evolving Fenway neighborhood into a vibrant community remains and thrives. Our students, faculty, staff, and our guests have immeasurably benefited from the work and activities of the Fenway Cultural District, and we strongly support its redesignation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before I hand it over to my colleagues for any questions, I. I realize I neglected to frame the issue properly. Most folks in this room know what we're here discussing, but just for uh, complete background for those who may watch the video later, um, technically what the council is weighing right now is uh, approving uh, and therefore passing along the reapplication of the Fenway Cultural District's designation by the Mass Cultural Council. These are five-year designations, as you heard, uh, first given in March of 2012 to the Fenway Cultural District, and therefore up for renewal this year. Uh, to advance to that final, to the state again, it does require a public meeting and uh, official vote by the local legislative body, therefore the Boston City Council. But I know my colleagues will have much more background since they were involved in the original push. Um, but first, for questions, some half of us were, half of us were, were not yet on the council, but would have supported it wholeheartedly. <laughs> uh, so first for questions, Councillor Josh Sagum. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. I, I don't really have much to question of what's been said. It's pretty clear that I think by the four of us um, sponsoring this legislation, we're going on the right track here that hearing from such a cross-section of different types of institutions uh, in this neighborhood is incredibly important. And I want to thank again, um, Julie, you and, and your work, um, you know, citywide on this issue is important. We need to keep moving forward. I think as we hear um, over and over again, um, you know, the lack of resources going towards arts and culture, that we really need to do everything we can 
um, as a city, as individuals, as institutions, to support what's going on and making sure that folks, as many of you said, if not all of you, about the open door <laughs> programs, about bringing people in who may not think that the Museum of Fine Arts is an option for them and their families, and to continue doing that. And if by redesignating this cultural district, we can help spread the word, and we can help organize, and we can help get people in here, um, whether it's through school groups, as individuals, as families, I think strengthens not just our neighborhood and our city, but our education system, our economy, uh, and our future here. So I certainly, uh, not that I had any doubts, but I, I do plan on fully uh, supporting this when it comes before the council. And I hope the uh, State Cultural Council will agree as well. It's clearly been a success these past five years, and we need to keep moving. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Zakum. Councilor Tito Jackson. Thank you so much, uh, Madam President. I want to thank the Museum of Fine Arts uh, for hosting us, and uh, Madam President, I hope you can get it in the budget so that we have a chamber that looks like uh, this room. Um, I, 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 I believe in you. Um, I want to thank uh, the uh, esteemed uh, panel, uh, and um, this is actually one of the first things that I got to work on as a city councilor, um, and I think it is uh, fitting that the person I got to work on it with, uh, her name, her last name is Brilliant. Um, because I think uh, the brilliance in uh, this is that oftentimes we leverage uh, resources and financial resources and social resources and uh, political capital. Uh, but the amazing part about this process is that it really looks to each other as an amazing resource. Um, and I think there is uh, really something to be said about what happened um, and the brilliance of also uh, not only bringing uh, these organizations together, but as a council, uh, bringing folks together. This is the first uh, in the city of Boston, and I want to uh, give props to uh, Councillor Presley, um, our former councillor, uh, Michael Ross, um, and the work that uh, he uh, did um, in, in uh, advancing this. And uh, about a week and a half ago, I got to go to um, Fall River um, and actually testify for a Roxbury Co uh, uh, Cultural Council, which uh, well, is the third. Um, so I've, I was involved in the first and the third. You can call me odd if you like. Um, but I'm very, very pleased uh, to have uh, that opportunity. I want to give... Um, a shout out also to a friend of mine in, in the audience, uh, Aaron from uh, the Huntington Y. Um, and I think the, the most important component here is that as the first uh, that we continue to work daily uh, to not only be the first in the sequence, but also uh, to work towards excellence. And I think what I've seen um, is uh, this uh, really robust uh, connection uh, between organizations that may or may not have been uh, collaborating uh, at uh, uh, the depth that they're collaborating at now. Um, there's also a, a, a cheerleading section for one another um, that I uh, see and feel uh, now. Um, I love the Opening the Doors uh, program and also um, one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me is that uh, Amel LaRue, who's a, uh, a R&B artist, um, played the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum, right? And there's something to be said about the fact that one of my favorite on, on the album is called Makes Me Whole. It's an amazing, uh, amazing album. But there is an R&B artist who played the Fenway. What happened there? What happened was folks from all over the city came. People who may or may not have been to the amazing place called the Isabel Stewart Gardner um, Museum. And there was an ownership there of the whole city in this place called uh, the Fenway Cultural District. That's what this is all about. Uh, and it's an amazing, amazing component. And I guess uh, the, my two last points are uh, Michael Porter, who uh, is um, from Harvard Business School, he has a cluster theory. And his theory basically says that businesses move to places where there's talent. Well, uh, that's not only businesses, that's actually people. Um, and we have seen that here. And uh, my last point is that a, a couple of weeks we're actually going to march in a parade um, celebrating pride, uh, Boston pride. Um, and we have a, still have a lot of work to do there. And interestingly, this year, and appropriately this year, um, as this redesignation is up, uh, the theme this year is Stronger Together. And I believe that uh, this um, 
redesignation, uh, and I am uh, wholehearted. I, it's really controversial. I just want to let y'all know that um, I'm going out there really on a limb right now. Uh, but I am definitely uh, emphatically uh, going to uh, vote for this um, and really look forward to uh, what the next five years uh, will bring um, with these amazing uh, institutions um, and that they uh, become more amazing by the connectivity uh, that is brought forward uh, here today. And I agree with the words of Fareed uh, Zakaria uh, that we need to lift our souls in uh, moments of uh, despair. And this is exactly what uh, has happened uh, through, uh, throughout this time. Uh, thank you so much. I look forward to the opportunity to uh, vote on this again um, and see the amazing things that will happen in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jackson. Councilor Ayanna Presley. Eloquent words um, by both our panelists uh, and my esteemed colleagues. And um, I'll just say, uh, at the time, as a freshman uh, counselor, it's hard to believe there's been such, you know, I'm We're only now. eight We're years old. in, and, and I'm a, you know, seasoned veteran now. But as a freshman counselor, uh, this was one of, um, uh, just truly an awesome experience. And one of the things I'm proud is to have shepherd, shepherded, and that's really the right word. It was just something that was shepherded. Um, we often talk about this symbiotic partnership and the collaboration and the cooperative spirit that made this possible. Um, and in talking about cultural district designations, um, you know, I use this phrasing a lot and it, and it uh, uh, just because I say it a lot doesn't make it any less true, but it is um, the best sort of collaboration because it is one that is uh, community led and government endorsed. And uh, where it gives um, the community, I think, uh, the weighted voice that it uh, deserves and the sense of pride in sort of taking that uh, audit of what already exists here and what should we be um, celebrating and championing. And um, it really underscores and highlights that which we already know, which is that um, arts and culture and innovation is teeming uh, throughout our city um, and is not uh, defined uh, to, one, um, uh, to one avenue. So. Uh, I do have some questions, uh, building upon the five-year success um, and as we uh, consider this redesignation, which of course we will support, but uh, I do think when you are the first, although there was a, um, a fundamentally sound blueprint to replicate um, outside of Boston, but when you are the first and you are your own analog, um, it is a gift, but also um, you know, you don't have another reference point per se. And so um, I do have a couple of questions, just, you know, one, if you would think about um, sort of lessons learned. Um, secondly, um, do you think that there's an opportunity now that we are onboarding more districts um, for um, cross-pollinating, sort of cross-marketing and coordination, and how might we do that so that we have the districts talking um, to one another? Um, and then I was just wondering, and I'm sorry uh, that I was late, it's your fault for holding it here because I was very distracted by the African bronze exhibit um, and uh, a nagging knee injury, so I don't move that quickly. But um, so uh, I would be curious to know if there have been any new assets um, as a part of the district. I'm trying to get a sense of how nimble and agile the district is. And then one issue that I recall that we thought might threaten the success of the district was um, when T-Service had been compromised. Um, I don't know if that was with the E-Line or something, there was a, um, something that was happening. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that that was resolved. And if it hasn't been resolved, that we know about it so that we can make sure that um, all transit access points that should support this district are fully functioning, so. In terms of the MBTA, at the time of the designation, there was significant concern that Green Line service to uh, the neighborhood would be eliminated on the weekends, which obviously would impact uh, everybody. And we're very pleased that that issue has been resolved favorably. And it isn't just about the Fenway Cultural District and the institutions on it, but it's also the access for many people out to the medical area. And so we thought the MBTA made the right decision in there. Uh, and, and reverse the, uh, the thinking about possible okay. cancellation. So that was uh, uh, successfully resolved. Okay, very good. Well, I guess I'll take the question about how we connect the districts with um, each other. Um, one of the ways to do that is actually through my office. I have um, been growing my staff and I have a director of planning and policy 
who is charged with being the liaison to all of the cultural districts as well as all of the Main Streets organizations. Um, and I know that the Main Streets are convened by the city and work together. Um, and we've been talking to each of the districts about what do they need from city government, not just the arts office, but we can be the conduit um, for that. And so we recognize that designation alone comes with little more than a nice sign. And um, the first time around, uh, districts get $5,000. Um, I don't know if renewal will get you $5,000. So um, we recognize that there is a real need to do more. And we've been actually in discussions with each of the districts of what that looks like. Um, so one example in the literary cultural district, hopefully everybody here knows that we have a literary cultural district. Um, last year, the mayor's mural crew collaborated to create a literary themed mural in the, in the mural district and beautify a particularly dank and dark and horrible kind of alleyway. So we are ready collaborators with all of the cultural districts to understand um, what do they need from city government or what do they need from partners who aren't already at the table, whether it's workforce development, the BPDA, um, arts and culture, um, Department of Environment, Transportation. So we're, we're happy to be that conduit and that connector within city government and then build out supports and programs um, where we can be really responsive uh, to your needs. Tonight, I think that my staff are going to a meeting in Roxbury to um, work with the partners for the newly designated Roxbury Cultural District. Um, we have uh, a collaboration with the Department of Public Works to incorporate um, public art in a, in a rotary reconstruction in Hyde Square and we're working really closely with Hyde Square Task Force who are looking to designate a cultural district there. So we're always looking for opportunities to connect the dots between all the different efforts going on within city government, overcome our own silos, and really help to um, make sure everyone is rowing in the same direction and, and kind of pointed towards the collective goal of stewarding these districts. Okay, I appreciate that, Chief, and I, I'm very encouraged that you know, arts and culture and the city is making great strides to be an integrated and whole partner uh, on par and on pace with all these other uh, industries and agencies uh, within the city as well it should be. Uh, and I'm encouraged to hear that there is a plan uh, to make sure these districts are talking to one another. You know, this is a city, um, 660,000 people, 22 very distinct neighborhoods, and I love the distinctive nature of each of our neighborhoods, but it's a very segregated city, and we do know that art and culture have a role to play um, in fostering those connections and breaking down those barriers and those silos, and so, you know, I don't know if it's open streets or whatever it is, but as long as we are thinking about ways for the districts to communicate with each other, I think it's to the benefit of everyone, um, uh, not only culture, culturally, but also from a revenue standpoint. Um, and I would just make one request. Um, I, I hope that, um, I know we're looking to uh, do an, an overhaul of our uh, airport, but I would love to see, um, you know, these districts promoted um, as a way, again, it's not just about enriching the experience for Boston residents, but incentivizing people to come into our neighborhoods and experience the true spirit of Boston um, and to spend money. So if there's some way um, that we could get that included in some of the, the promotional things about the city of Boston that are at the airport, some of the murals and, and, and things uh, along those lines. Um, so cross-marketing, um, and are there any new assets? So just trying to get a sense of the nimbleness or the, the, uh, of the district. From the original mapping, are there any new assets? Okay. Kelly, if you could come up to the microphone just so the video will pick up the feed. Thanks. So we've always considered Berkeley College of Music squarely in our Fenway Cultural District, but it was brought to our attention 
that from the Mass Cultural Council standpoint, it wasn't an official um, institution in the district, so we've um, obviously corrected that for this reapplication and changed the map to definitely include Berkeley. Um, that would be uh, just, you know, not, um, it would be like ludicrous not to have Berkeley College of Music in, so that's one change. Um, one thing I'm sort of, um, you know, we're sort of proud of, we're working um, with Fenway Community Center, which isn't technically in our district, it's a community resource um, in the West Fens, and we'll be doing a Made in the Fenway, um, where artists can come and we're co-sponsoring oh, it, great. and they can sell work. And then the third thing, which is very much in an embryonic stage, is we're working really for the first time with Fenway Civic Association and Fenway um, CDC, Community Development Corps, to do something, and we haven't even even decided what that something is yet in terms of a cultural program together, but it is, I think, in the history of these three organizations in the Fenway, the first time we've ever worked together, so I'm really happy that that's happening. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, and congratulations on that. And that actually would have been my final question, which is, um, it, um, you know, fostering a greater ecosystem to support local artists. I know that was something we spoke a great deal about at the final hearing for the Roxbury Cultural District, so um, I'm excited to hear that we're creating venues and vehicles to support local artists. So, bravo, excellent job. You wear the first label very well, and um, we look forward to, to, to much more um, uh, enrichment and, and great success. Great, thank you, Councilor Presley. At this time, unless my colleagues have other comments, we'll transition from the panel over to public testimony. So panelists, feel free to stay, feel free to stay in the audience, and I know some of you have some schedule constraints as well, so thank you for joining us. We appreciate your time very much. Uh, just an administrative note about public testimony. We have two microphones, so folks can line up on either side and we'll, we'll alternate back and forth. Um, and I will call folks up in groups who signed up on the testify page. And if you didn't sign up but feel moved to speak, uh, feel free, we'll, at the end, we'll, we'll open it up uh, to any other members of the public as well. So the first group up will be Tim Horn, Rocco DeRico, Christina Lanzel, and Gavin Kleespies. And um, so to, as folks are coming down, if we can, generally the time limit is two minutes, and if you could state your name and address for the record, just so we, everyone's fully identified uh, for folks watching later on. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Tim Horn. I live at 120 Norway Street. I'm the president of Fenway Civic Association and a 30-year resident of the Fenway. I'm here to express Fenway Civic's strong support for the renewal of the Fenway Cultural District designation. <clears throat> Sorry. Our association is an all-volunteer civic group founded in 1961. We are dedicated to building a safe, clean, and beautiful Fenway. Fenway Civic has and continues to work actively in cooperation with Fenway Alliance and the Cultural District Committee in support of the Cultural District. FCA serves on the Cultural District Committee and believes the Cultural District designation provides a means of highlighting the very unique melange of cultural character and vitality that exists in the Fenway neighborhood. The initial vision for the district outlined a series of uh, five uh, objectives for its first five years. They were to promote Fenway as a cultural designation, to build partnerships and artistic opportunities, to increase the beauty and vitality of the district, and to build the creative economy through the arts. Uh, I believe our district has seen great progress on all four fronts. Specifically, this has included the preservation of the Huntington Theater, the new and exciting opportunities posed by Future City, the progress made for the Avenue of the Arts in bridging public and private realms, the increase of permanent and temporary art installations in new and previously underrepresented areas, the growth of the annual Opening Our Doors event, and finally, the growing collaboration and support for artists in arts access within the Fenway. Renewal of the cultural district designation will support and enhance the opportunities for, many, for the many artists, musicians, and cultural institutions that call the Fenway home. Fenway Civic believes this renewal to be not only appropriate, but vital and necessary to advance and enhance the cultural opportunities in the Fenway, and by extension, the city of Boston. I'd like to thank you for letting us comment today and express uh, our sincere hope that the cultural designation be extended to the Fenway. And I would just like to add off cuff, um, it's great to see 
the large institutions represented here today, but I think it's really important that we remember that there's Kajiaso Studios, there's the Fenway Studios, there's uh, voice coaches, there are guitar coaches, there are all the elements uh, to support the arts in our neighborhood. They exist already and they're strengthened by this designation. And um, it's really important for the smaller institutions and the individuals than it is really for the larger institutions. And for that reason, I really think that the designation is important. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Rocco DeRico, and I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations at Tufts University. Um, thank you, President Wu, Councilor Zakem, Councilor Jackson, Councilor Presley for being here today, and thank you so much for your support and leadership of the Fenway. Um, I want to offer a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, Tufts has been in Boston for a long time, uh, but we're relatively new to the Fenway, having acquired the School for the Museum of Fine Arts last year, and I want to thank Mark Kerwin for all his help uh, throughout that process. Uh, and we've learned a lot about the Fenway over the course of this past year. We've discovered that uh, the Fenway is home to 21 amazing cultural and academic institutions. We've learned that the Fenway is a major economic engine for the city, attracting more than three and a half million visitors a year. Our academic and cultural institutions employ over 15,000 people here in the Fenway. Our colleges educate more than 50,000 students. And all of these visitors students and employees spend money. They enhance the neighborhood while also providing tax revenue for the city and the state. Um, and, but what we really realize, what, that, what makes the Fenway so special is the spirit of partnership and collaboration. Uh, and the organization that brings that all together for us is the Fenway Alliance led by the amazing Kelly Brilliant. Um, it's really been just an amazing experience for us to come into the neighborhood and be welcomed by so many of our uh, like institutions uh, and by the neighborhood. Uh, we've supported a lot of other smaller nonprofits in the neighborhood, um, and we're very proud of our city studio program, which offers free art classes to um, BPS students at the SMFA. Um, and I think what this uh, designation does is it really helps brand and market the neighborhood uh, to tourists from all around the world. Uh, it's allowed us to uh, work together to improve infrastructure, protect the environment, enhance our local economy, and promote cultural programming for the residents of Boston and for the Commonwealth. I think you'll all agree that Fenway is an amazing neighborhood that attracts students, tourists, and artists from all around the world. Um, and the Fenway Cultural District has clearly illustrated its value, uh, but also its potential. We have been able to attract people to Boston while also supporting program for programming for residents and nonprofit organizations in our own backyard. We've attracted, attracted artists, cultural organizations, and businesses of all kinds to this neighborhood, and they have seen the vibrancy of Fenway, and they want to be a part of it. For all these reasons and so many more, I urge you to support the redesignation of Fenway as a cultural district. Thank you, Rocco. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Gavin Cleesbees, and I represent the Massachusetts Historical Society, uh, which is at 1154 Boylston Street, although I personally live in Central Square in Cambridge, which is a different cultural district. Um, uh, the Mass Historical Society is the oldest historical society in America. Uh, we are primarily a research library, and we have a, a relatively amazing collection. We have about 13 million manuscripts, including the papers of three of the first six U.S. presidents. Uh, much of our collection um, is, all of our collection is available to the public for use for free, uh, but I would say that many people don't necessarily know about that. Um, we have tremendous resources for people who are interested in the history of Boston uh, or the Boston metro area, including John Winthrop's diary, Paul Revere's records, um, the records of the 54th Regiment, the first African-American regiment to fight in the Civil War, uh, the papers of Jerry Studs, the first um, openly gay U.S. congressman. Um, so we have tremendous resources, but frankly, many people don't necessarily know about MHS or where we are or, or that we're accessible to the public for free. Uh, participating in groups like the Fenway Alliance allows us to broaden our reach and to connect to different audiences. Participating in projects like the Open Air Doors uh, Festival um, brings new people into MHS uh, to see our collections and to have a sense of what we have to offer. 
um, and it really broadens the reach of the organization and it opens us up to people who are not our traditional audiences. So we very much appreciate our partnership with the Fenway Alliance uh, and being in uh, a cultural district, which I think just brings more people into the area who are interested in exploring the institutions and resources that are available. Um, I'd also just say that uh, in today's environment, when federal funding for organizations like ours, which has in the past been very vital, uh, is increasingly uh, in doubt, um, rallying local support becomes more and more important, and bringing people together who care about uh, institutions locally uh, is of, of great importance. So I would highly encourage you to support the redesignation of the Fenway Cultural District. Thank you. Thank you. And as Christina is speaking, the next on deck will be Carol Lasky, Jeannie Knox, and Peggy Birkenall. Good afternoon, um, Councilor Wu, Councilor Presley, um, panelists. <laughs> I'm uh, Christina Lancel. I head the Urban Culture Institute, and I'm also on the faculty of the uh, Wentworth Institute of Technology, teaching uh, in the architecture department. Um, I'm also in great support of the redesignation of the cultural district. Um, as a, from my own perspective, I can uh, contribute that. Um, uh, I've been employed actually in this in the Fenway area pretty much for the past 20 years, off and on. For the most part, though, in uh, by institutions here in the district. So. It is a, an amazing um, sort of asset uh, to all the institutions and the cross, uh, institutional and, and cross-cultural kind of uh, collaboration that can take place uh, is also evident in some of the projects that I've been able to work on with, with my students, for instance, where we worked on a um, Fenway cultural assets map. Of course, the uh, Fenway Alliance itself and uh, the cultural uh, district has mapped uh, cultural assets, but we actually expanded it to include um, architectural um, landmarks, and um, that's something that perhaps uh, could be thought about more also as a way to um, engage visitors to the district. Um, and of course, we also looked at uh, public art and, and uh, open space or, or parks. So these are some of the areas also um, um, that uh, we think of them as uh, sort of connected, uh, connective tissue um, bringing folks to the to the area, and um, so um, again, the cultural district is, is a fabulous asset. Um, it has all those world class institutions, but uh, also smaller local um, uh, community based organizations. I've also had the pleasure with working with the. Um, uh, Fenway neighborhood organizations on some of the public art initiatives and, and there's great enthusiasm and an incredible uh, volunteerism in the neighborhood uh, and they're all very conscious of the fact that this is a cultural district and that they're all part of something larger um, connecting uh, sort of the dots. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councillors Wu and Presley and remaining panelists and <laughs> fellow citizens and friends. My name is Carol Lasky. I live and work at 30 The Fenway. I'm a longtime resident, and I have experience to share both personally and professionally of the Fenway. And uh, as a recipient, both personally and professionally, of the bountiful cultural riches of the Fenway community. If I had to sum up my 30 plus years of being in this neighborhood in a couple of words, it would be. It's all here. Let's start on the personal level. I was determined to buck the suburban trend and raise my three kids on the Fenway. My oldest son attended his first Symphony Hall concert when he was two and a half years old. And those ushers were crazy worried that a two and a half year old was gonna be able to sit through a two and a half hour long concert on St. Patrick's Day of the chieftains, they were worried and they kept pointing to the escape, you know, not escape, the, the exits in the room so I would be able to get this kid out as soon as he became restless. He did not become restless. In fact, his only tears happened when the concert was over and the stage was suddenly empty and quiet. And he said, turning to me, where did they go? The next day, we went over to the infamous uh, or famous Jack's Drum Shop on May at Rest in Peace on uh, Boylston Street and purchased for him his first musical instrument, which was an Irish drum called a baron. And he became kind of known in the neighborhood as the little drummer boy. Luckily for him, 
the Boko and Berkeley students would play impromptu concerts at all hours, all seasons, not only on the little patch of grass in front of our house, but also in Mother's Rest, where he was very well acquainted with the swings and sliding board. And so these young artists inspired my little son to see music as, well, something that people do. He had his first violin lessons at the New England Conservatory, and growing up, he accompanied me and his siblings to performances and concerts at Jordan Hall, Symphony Hall, the Huntington Theater, Boko's Recital Spaces, Berkeley Performance Center, the MFA, the Maparium at the Christian Science Center, and I could go on and on. Because it is all here. Because we live here, my family has grown up with the assumption of pervasive art and creative expression. It's almost as though we are the cultural tourists here, right at home, right where we live. On a professional note, my design communications firm, Cahoots, enjoys long-standing relationships with clients in different parts of the region and the nation. But the most meaningful work that we do is right here in the community. Over all of Cahoots' years, and I did the math today, and it's over 30, which is a startling number to me, um, I've always felt plugged into a very vital, very accessible, nourishing, creative energy source here, a renaissance receptivity to creative thinking, now more than ever. There really hasn't been a project of greater personal and professional satisfaction and profound inspiration for me than the brand, outreach, and educational program we've recently designed for the newly restored Muddy River. I can't express the personal joy and professional satisfaction of partnering with a wide array of stakeholders, environmental pioneers really, including the Fenway Alliance, who have devoted so much time, energy, and creative passion to unearthing a river that was buried in part beneath a parking lot. And if it conjures up the old Joni Mitchell song, it should. My job has been to give voice to those organizations and individuals and ensure that the waterway continues to flow and bring health to our urban environment, including, quite selfishly, right across from where I live and work. It is all here. As a mother, as a creative professional, as an attendee at the Mass Historical Society lectures, most recently a historical investigation of the roots of ice cream, chocolate, and donuts, um, of Berkeley College of Music events, most memorably a, uh, not just a festival of cat videos, but an international <laughs> festival of cat videos. Um, as well as participation as a reviewer at Mass College of Art, as well as a facilitator of programming at the Fenway Community Center, as well as a longtime Huntington Theater subscriber, an MFA member, a BSO fan, I am right at home. Excuse me, I am right at home here too. And I just can't tell you it's a real honor to speak for my neighborhood and for this redesignation. Thank you. Thank you very much. President, Councillor, and Mark, and public. My name is Jeannie Knox, and I'm here representing the Emerald Necklace Conservancy at 125 The Fenway. We're a nonprofit organization that works in partnership with Boston Parks and Recreation, our Commonwealth, as well as the town of Brookline, to care for the Emerald Necklace, which is Olmsted's park system through the city. We reside in the park itself in a repurposed pump house, now called the Shattuck Visitor Center, which was designed by the renowned architect H.H. H. Richardson and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. We opened the visitor center, we had raised funds, repurposed the building, and moved in in January, um, I think with about three feet of snow in 2011. And it 
was probably a few months, but it seemed like almost immediately Kelly Brilliant reached out to us and welcomed us into the neighborhood. Um, and from there on, we participated in opening our doors and really felt extremely welcomed. Uh, I'm here today to support the redesignation of the Fenway Cultural District. Olmsted's Jewel, the Back Bay Fen, sits in the heart of the Fenway Cultural District. Once a fouled and polluted mudflat, Olmsted transformed, transformed the fens into scenic parkland. This sanitary improvement project spurred the growth of the neighborhood as Mrs. Gardner and others moved in. As a cultural landscape, it's only fitting that the Back Bay Fens can call the Fenway Cultural District its home. So many of us in this area have had a significant role in the Muddy River Improvement Project. In fact, the Conservancy itself was born from the advocacy efforts to restore and reinvest in the river. And we all celebrated together the completion of phase one of the project at the recent ribbon cutting of the new Justine Meadliff Park. The Fenway Cultural District offers innumerable opportunities for people, both near and far, to connect with the arts, the landscape, and each other. Thank you. Thank you. And next up after Peggy will be Rich, Rich Giordano, Richard Rouse, and David McMullen. Good afternoon, President Wu, Councillor Presley. Hi, Mark. Uh, I'm Peggy Birchnell, the Curator of Education and Public Programs at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And I think after the, after the Emerald Necklace, we're probably the first institution to, to be here in, in this neighborhood. So the Gardner is often referred to as Boston's hidden jewel. And while we like the jewel part, he doesn't like a little bling, we're not so crazy about the hidden part, and we've done a lot to counter that impression, especially after the, new, the opening of our new building five years ago. But the Fenway Alliance and the Cultural District has really been part of that. Opening our doors day has brought thousands of new visitors to this area. Many of them, as we know from our own surveys, first timers, people who were never, never thought that they might be welcome to the cultural resources of Boston and are very pleasantly surprised to find out that these are places that they want to come again and again, they want to bring their kids, they want to become members, and they want to support these institutions. With that, in, with that inspiration in mind, I think Kelly has been a, a, a wonderful advocate for, for collaboration and for bringing bringing the neighborhood together, and the events that, that we're currently doing, three family-friendly nights, uh, free nights, are very much part of that idea of welcoming Bostonians to our institutions. Our monthly Third Thursdays, which are events for millennials that again bring them here to introduce them to wonderful art experiences in a social setting, also open new visitors to the, the opportunities that are here at the Fenway. I would also like to say that one of the things that almost all of these events do now are that they are co-created and co-produced with some of the many talented artists and producers and curators who are here in this area. Uh, the R&B concert that, that, uh, Cal that Councillor Jackson mentioned, that is part of our new RISE series that is co-curated by Berkeley grad uh, Ro Shea Rose. So all of these, what I think the spirit that uh, this cultural district embodies is this sense of all of us working together, collaborating, and, and creating this kind of synergy so that we can showcase all of that's great about Boston's cultural life. So I very much hope that this uh, cultural uh, designation continues. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Peggy. Council President Wu, uh, Councilor Presley, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Um, my name is Richard Giordano. I'm testifying on behalf of Fenway Community Development Corporation 
uh, in complete support for the redesignation of the Fenway Cultural District. We hope that the council carries that message up to the state. Um, I, I think you all are probably more acquainted with all of the benefits of this designation and what the collaboration has done than um, probably myself and many other people here. Um, you know that it's, it's, it's been an economic driver that this uh, alliance and uh, collaboration brings millions of visitors to the city. Um, it employs uh, tens of thousands of people in the area. Um, collaboratively, um, you know, folks have worked on infrastructure projects, on cultural exchange, on bringing people here. Um, but really, uh, what I want to talk about is the fact that the arts and culture and what these institutions can do uh, can actually change lives of people, that they enrich the city, that um, I hope what we can do in the future is to strengthen the work that we've all known about and breath, you know, reach out and bring in more residents, more folks in the Fenway, introduce them more to what all of these institutions offer. Um, you know, the Fenway Alliance and the, the opening our doors, I think, should be the beginning um, and that, you know, if we can do more and more things like that and bring more folks into the museum, to the schools, to, uh, to Berkeley, uh, we want to collaborate and put the word out to the rest of the community about the 400 uh, concerts that Berkeley is doing free this year. Um, you know, this kind of thing enriches people. And also, we need to remember that in the Fenway and in Boston, we have uh, budding Picassos and Chagalls and Coltrane's and Bernstein's, and the more we bring those people to these places, uh, the richer the city will be, the more we change lives. And I'm also hoping that we can open up a new uh, effort at some point and figure out ways to keep those budding Picassos and Chagalls and Coltrane's here in Boston that maybe we can all collaborate on affordable live-work uh, housing situations uh, and that we, we grow culture here in the city for the residents as well as the millions of people who are an economic driver for the city. So we hope you will redesignate and uh, put that application up to the state. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, good afternoon, Council President, Councilor Presley. My name is Richard Rouse. I'm the Executive Director of Mission Hill Main Streets. And uh, I want to add my voice to the chorus of people advocating for the redesignation. But I also want to say a word of praise for the, for the Council for coming out here to hear what an effect uh, this particular uh, act has uh, borne to the area. Uh, but also to praise you about uh, when you do something right. I mean, you receive a lot of criticism as, a, as, a, as an elected body, uh, and uh, you should know when things go well, and so I'm glad you're hearing it today. Uh, what, I agree with everything that's been said so far. Kelly is brilliant. Everything is, <laughs> it, it all goes well. But there has been also an infectious, uh, aspect to this. This has benefited the Mission Hill neighborhood and our business community enormously in the last five years. Uh, we notice it, we see it, we uh, are uh, seeing an increase in the amount of people who are coming from the institutions and visiting and getting to know the city better and knowing another place that is absolutely wonderful, Mission Hill. And so uh, it all helps in the greater whole and uh, I wish to commend you, and I also want to say that I've uh, respected the two-minute limit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and after David will be Courtney Howard, Linda McNally, Kelly Brilliant, mm -hmm. and Suzanne Aiken. Uh, hello. So um, I'm David McMullen. I'm here from New England Conservatory. Um, most of what I had to say has been said, so I'll be quick. Um, the, the Fenway Cultural District, uh, people have mentioned the Opening Our Doors event. Um, on behalf of NEC, our doors have always been open. We have a 1,000 free concerts a year. 
Uh, we have outreach programs that get to 16,000 people in all the city's neighborhoods with more than 100 community partners all around. But people don't necessarily know that. And uh, the Fenway Cultural District has been a great way of helping us to get that message out. And also uh, a vehicle for concrete collaborations with many of the other institutions in the district. Um, and I'm sure I won't try to list them because I'll leave some off. Uh, <clears throat> but it's also helped um, my particular job at NEC is in the development office. Um, and I've been involved in raising money for the new building, which is almost complete and will be open to the public in September. Um, and just last week, I had the privilege of presenting to uh, one of the city trusts regarding a project we're doing to, uh, to rework our, the streetscapes around the NEC's campus. Um, Kelly was there to advocate on our behalf, and Councillor uh, Jackson uh, also wrote a letter of support for which we're very grateful. Um, but I've noticed that this has made it possible for NEC to change the way we present ourselves, not just to say we're a good institution, you should support us, but to be able to situate it within the fabric of the cultural district in the city. You know, so our, our project is conceived not just as, well, this will make things nicer for us, but this will be a, a gateway to the cultural district, you know, right where the avenue of the arts start. Um, and to be able not just to, to make that argument, but to think of ourselves in that way, I think is very helpful in advancing both the institution and the collaborations in the district. Uh, so for that reason and all the others that have been mentioned, uh, I hope you redesignate. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Thank you, David. My name is Courtney Howard, and I'm representing Emanuel College. We're located at 400 Fenway. Um, on behalf of the staff, administration, faculty, and students of the college, I would like to say that we're thrilled to be part of the Fenway Alliance, a group that promotes collaborative, collaborative activities and events, such as our on-campus artist in residence program, which celebrates creativity and unites artists from around the globe. The college experience is enhanced by the wonderful opportunities being offered across the institutions within this vibrant community. Therefore, Emmanuel supports the redesignation of the Fenway Cultural District with great enthusiasm and deep appreciation. Thank you. Right, Thank good. you, Courtney. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Aiken, and I'm the resident life director at Susan Bayless Assisted Living. Oh, it's uh, a residence for age 62 and older elders of uh, low, moderate, or mid, and market uh, assisted living, which the city did uh, help to, uh, to build and to, pro uh, to, um, to collaborate with, with Susan Bayless, who um, helped to build this home. And we have about, at the moment, 77 residents, and I'm probably the luckiest activities director in the entire state of Massachusetts. And it is due in large part to all the cultural events and all the cultural uh, adv advantages that I have through Kelly, through the Fenway Cultural District, and through all of our neighbors, like the schools and uh, the fine museums. And the nicest part about it is that a lot of our elderly are not able to go out. Therefore, I've gotten so many advantages bringing the cultural district into our home and helping these elders feel connected to what they are interested in and have always been interested in instead of watching them kind of feel as though their worlds are pulled away and that they're not being served as far as what they love to do in a spiritual, in a cultural, in, in an enriching way, especially with the music, with the arts that we have available. And um, it's, it's a pleasure to work there because of the resources and the friendships and the collaborations that I've made. So there's probably not an individual in this room that hasn't impacted Susan Bayless assisted living through the cultural district. So I heartily recommend the, uh, the redistricting proposal. So thank you very much and I hope you all have a great day. Thank, thank you. you, Suzanne. Hello, my name is Linda McNally. I'm proud to be the founding president of Friends of Fenway Studios. And I thank you, counselors, for giving us this opportunity today. And Mark, thank you for hosting this wonderful opportunity. 
Time certainly flies. It seems we just blinked and five years have gone by and Kelly had asked our meeting, uh, our committee, who would be interested in the formulation of a Fenway Cultural District. Without hesitation, everyone at the meeting said, we're on board. It was with Kelly at the helm and of course, Anita Walker with the MCC that gave us the guidance all along the way that brought this to fruition. And I believe it is also because a mantra, the mindset of all the institutions and participants in the Fenway Cultural District believe in the adage, a rising tide lifts all boats. We are all here for each other. We are happy to help each other succeed. And it is because of this that we hope there will be the redesignation so that we can continue in those efforts. Thank you so much. Very good, thank, thank you. Thank you. Kelly, would you like to close us out with any statement? Yes. I was going to enter into the record the um, really lovely letter that Fenway Civic Association um, wrote on behalf of supporting the Fenway Cultural District, but because Tim was nice enough to come, he has a busy schedule and read it, I, won't, I do not need to do that, I wanna thank Tim. Um, but I really just want to express my appreciation first to the um, city council, um, President Wu. Uh, her, she was, um, and her team, they are so organized, they make this all very easy. So I want to thank the team. And I'd like to thank Councillor um, Josh Zakum. But I want to give a special shout out to Councillors Tito Jackson and Councillors and Councillor Ayanna Presley. They were there with me from the beginning. They, when we first um, proposed this five years ago, they just listened so well. They got it so quickly. They kept me honest. They asked all the right questions. And I think they really helped to make this a better district in its beginning. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank um, all my panelists. Um, they're kind of busy people. They have different meetings. But their words meant so much to me. And they totally re-inspire and re-energize me when I hear them speak so eloquently and from the heart about the benefits of the district. And I must give a special shout out on this one to Mark Kerwin, the Deputy Director of the Museum of Fine Arts, for hosting us here in this setting, which makes it really special. And to, as my chair, just really keeping us all together and keeping me on task. And that's sometimes a difficult job, but he does it very well. And finally, I must thank Daniel um, Smith, who's in the audience. Can you raise your hand? He is our assistant director, and he has been a complete joy to work with. Uh, he got married um, just a, a recently, a couple of weeks ago. He bought a house. He has never dropped a beat in terms of the efforts he puts in to the cultural district, so I really want to thank him. And finally, just all of you who took time out in the middle of your workday to come and express your thoughts. I can actually get a little teary thinking about how much that means to me, and I just want to thank you, the public, and really you're just my colleagues that helped me do this, so thank you. Perfect, Annie. Thank you, Kelly. Um, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak? Nope. Then at this point, I want to thank again everybody who came and participated, um, the City Council, um, with, without any unforeseen circumstances, I anticipate we'll take this up at our next council meeting, <laughs> and um, that, as you heard, it shall not be too controversial of a vote, but I really appreciate it, and thank you to everyone who puts time to make this such a, a beautiful, vibrant, and um, welcoming part of our city. So this adjourns docket number 0483, uh, hearing for an order to on the Fenway Cultural District.